questions at one time. <laughs> yeah, two pretty unrelated okay, questions. Just in in the one. end of suffering, mm -hmm. I'm celebrating a second century Buddhist teaching, teacher named Nagarjuna. And he, in a way, described very accurately how remote viewing works. And he said, you have to give up conditioned awareness. In conditioned awareness, you're responding to what your parents taught you, what television taught you, what teachers tell you, um, what your society tells you is right, and most of all, what your ego tells you. So if you reside in conditioned awareness, you tend to be self-centered, uh, self-pitying, suffering, and lonely. Mm -hmm. And he said that if you want to expand your awareness, to take part in the spaciousness that's available, you must move from conditioned awareness to naked awareness or non-local awareness. He talked about naked existence in which you are flexible and generous and spacious and loving and joyous and non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. So you have an opportunity to experience things as they are rather than through your conditioning. In the conditioned state, even 1,500 years ago, they were talking about the dangers of naming and grasping mm -hmm. interf as a mechanism that causes you to interfere with what's actually happening. And going, taking that back to the other part of the question that seems totally unrelated, seemed totally unrelated, the experience that you noticed with your colleagues at Lockheed was an example of what happens when that identity is taken away from you. That's exactly right. I spent a decade at Lockheed. Uh, I had an idea that you could put lasers on airplanes to detect wind shear and air turbulence. And I had several programs with Lockheed working there. I went back to my roots. After, remote, after doing remote sensing with ESP, I went to Lockheed to do remote sensing with lasers. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, remote sensing with ESP is more reliable because the lasers don't work worth a damn when it's raining, and the ESP works whether it's raining or, or <laughs> sun is shining. But at Lockheed, what I observed in my first years there, as I would read the Lockheed newspaper week after week, that there were pages called In Memoriam commemorating or celebrating the death of people, old employees. And what I observed is a lot of them weren't very old. Lockheed has, <clears throat> Lockheed has more or less mandatory retirement at 65. And the thing that pushed me to write The End of Suffering is I began to see in a number of different instances how people experience suffering defending the story of who they think they are. The conditioning you were talking about That's earlier. right, defending the conditioning of who they think they are. And it's the idea of defending your business card. If you think who you are is what it says on your business card, I can guarantee that you're in for a lot of suffering mm -hmm. because that won't last. Right. Similarly, if you think that who you are is what you see in the mirror in the morning, that's also going to be a big disappointment because that's going to change. So the thrust of this book is to encourage people to have a more spacious view to recognize that who they are is really a non-local awareness fortunate enough to reside as a body for this time because we know that bodies are hard to come by and we're very fortunate to have one it allows us to share intimacy and share love and communicate with our loved ones through having bodies and we should take good care of them so i'm certainly not saying that we should neglect our body but it's an error to think that that's all of who you are